Joma wrote specific characteristics of our people's war early in 1973 in a Yuji house in the mountain provinces. We first conducted the research on the geography and history of the Philippines and of course read and analyzed the report sent in by the regional party committees since the re-establishment of the party in December 1968. So by the time the article was written, the party and its revolutionary forces had already been in existence for five years with regional committees established all over the country. By then, Philippine Society and Revolution had already been published in several editions from the first mimeograph edition by the Central Publishing House, serialized in the Philippine Collegian of the University of the Philippines, subsequently domestically by a Manila-based printing press and then by Takung Pao Press in Hong Kong for international distribution. So were the guide for establishing the People's Democratic Government and the Revolutionary Guide to Land Reform, issued in September 1972. IPO consolidation of the party had been proceeding well with the party membership greatly expanded with the primary course fulfilled on a wide scale and the intermediate course up for fulfillment. The advanced course was being undertaken by the party central committee among party cadres through the revolutionary school of Mao Zedong thought. The AD courses were synchronized with organizational plan. As for the party membership, the following is a quote from the chairman's political report to the CC plenum based on the last count at the beginning of this year. About 55% of our membership are in the countryside and about 45% are in the Manila, Rizal region and other urban areas all over the archipelago. About 53% of the party membership are of peasant origin, about 4% of Worker origin, about 43% are of petty bourgeois origin. Only recently, there has been some considerable increase in the membership of peasant origin. What may be considered the most serious error incurred within the party during the last three years is sectarianism, which greatly hampered the organizational building of the party. The persistence of small group mentality complicated the methods of increasing party membership with the failure to recruit several hundreds of mass activists in the party. The party and the New People's Army have already established 735 barrio organizing committees and 60 barrio revolutionary committees. These people's committees govern a total population of about 400,000 and are found in, in a total of 18 provinces, 7 in northern Luzon, 5 in central Luzon, 4 in southern Luzon, and 2 in western Visayas. We have been able to reach so many provinces by two methods of expansion, one by expansion advancing wave upon wave and using border areas of several provinces and two by leaping over white areas and sending sing single cadres or teams to separate strategic points. Northern Luzon has 515 barrio organizing committees and 50 revolutionary, barrio revolutionary committees and Central Luzon 150 and 10 respectively. Southern Luzon 60 barrio organizing committees and Western Visayas 10. After three years, we now have in the New People's Army the strength of 72 regular squads or 800 regulars armed with modern weapons. This should be equivalent to eight full regular companies, but we are still in the general process of bringing squads into regular platoon formations. There are now 10 regular platoons. Apart from these platoons, we have one regular company and are building in the process, and we are in the process of building another one. It is only a matter of short period that we shall be able to adequately put up <coughs> commands at the company level. The armed strength of the People's Army includes not only its regular fighters, but also about 1,500 local guerrilla fighters armed mainly with old single-action rifles and homemade rifles of the shotgun type and about 16,000 militia members. Building the Revolutionary United Front, a People's Revolutionary Government, set up special organs, the preparatory commission of the National Democratic Front to help the Central Committee in winning over allies in the cities and to prepare the way for the National Democratic Front as an intermediate step toward the People's Democratic Republic. Apart from the introduction, specific characteristics of our people's war has seven parts as follows. The National Democratic Revolution of a New Type, two, protracted war in the countryside, three, fighting a small mountainous archipelago, four, from small to weak to big and strong, five, a fascist puppet dictatorship amidst crisis, 
6. Under 1 imperialist power and 7. Decline of U.S. imperialism and advance of the world revolution. I quote from the introduction. From the great treasury of Marxism-Leninism, we draw basic principles and historical lessons to shed light on the people's war that we are waging. But these are of general value. They are a general guide to our action. To rest content with them without integrating them with, without concrete practice is to turn them into lifeless dogma. To dispense with them is to engage in blind action. As in all matters, we must integrate theory and practice in the conduct of people's war. The universal theory of Marxism, Leninism, Mao Zedong thought must be applied to the concrete conditions of the Philippine Revolution. We adhere firmly to the great Lenin's teaching. The soul of Marxism is the concrete analysis of concrete conditions. Only by understanding the specific characteristics of our own people's war can we understand the laws that govern it and thus can we adopt and implement the correct strategy and tactics for carrying it forward to victory. The basic principles and historical lessons already found in the universal theory of the revolutionary proletariat have been paid for in blood by various peoples triumphant in their respective revolution. But as far as carrying out and winning our own people's war is concerned, there is nothing more important than those principles and lessons that we learn on the basis of Philippine conditions and our own revolutionary experience. In this regard, we put the highest premium on those principles and lessons paid for in blood by our own people, integrating Marxist-Leninist theory with Philippine practice is a two-way process. One, the National Democratic Revolution of a New Type details the character and requirements of the Philippine Revolution, our country being semi-colonial and semi-feudal under the indirect rule of U.S. imperialism, whose most reliable agents and puppets are the big comprador landlords and big bureaucrats. The overwhelming majority of our 41 million people, more than 90% of them, are severely exploited and oppressed by the big compradors and big landlords, who together with their closest and best paid political and technical subalterns, compose a tiny minority that is no more than 2% of the population. The most oppressed and exploited are the toiling masses of workers and peasants. The urban petty bourgeoisie and the middle or national bourgeoisie also suffer from the semi-colonial and semi-feudal situation, with the former stratum suffering more than the latter. Our national democratic revolution is a continuation of the old type, which was led by a nascent bourgeoisie but differs from it in the sense that it is of the new type led by the proletariat. It is part of the proletarian socialist revolution, which has emerged since the first global inter-imperialist war and the victory of the great socialist October revolution. Though we are still fighting for a national democratic revolution, this constitutes a preparation for carrying out a socialist revolution in our country. The party wields two weapons against the enemy. These are armed struggle and the National United Front. These are interrelated like the spear and the shield. One serves the other. The National Democratic Front ensures the widest possible popular support for armed struggle. It splits the enemy ranks and isolates the worst single enemy at a time. Armed struggle is specifically the weapon for carrying out the central task of the revolution, which is the destruction and overthrow of the enemy rule and the seizure of political power. The primacy of armed struggle over parliamentary struggle is asserted. Between armed struggle and parliamentary struggle, the former is principal and the latter is secondary. Every genuine revolutionary knows that the chief component of the reactionary state is the reactionary army. The Filipino people are helpless without their own army. They cannot take a single step towards smashing the entire military bureaucratic machinery of the enemy without the people's army. The basic alliance of the proletariat and the peasantry is the foundation of the National United Front. The stronger this alliance is in the course of people's war, the stronger is the desire of the urban petty bourgeoisie to join the National United Front and take active part in revolutionary work. Second part, protracted war in the countryside. 85% of the national population is in the countryside. Of this rural population, the poor peasants together with the farm workers comprise about 75%. The middle 
peasants about 15%, the rich peasants about 5%. The landlords may be only 1% or 2%. About 3 or 4% is taken up by agricultural wage earners, artisans, small peddlers, merchants, students, teachers, and other professionals. There are drastic deviations from these percentages only in particular places where there are mines, logging, modern plantations, and some industries. Fishermen along the coast, sea coasts are mainly peasants. <clears throat> On the basis of these facts, the peasant population and the countryside have a special significance to us in waging people's war. The main social problem, the single problem affecting the greatest number of people lies in the countryside. It is the land problem. Feudalism and semi-feudalism oppress and exploit the poor peasants, the farm workers, and the lower middle peasants. Without focusing attention on this problem and providing it with a solution, we cannot draw into the ranks of the revolution the most formidable force that can overwhelm the enemy. Agrarian revolution is the solution. The peasant masses are aroused and mobilized to overthrow landlord authority and carry out land reform step by step. Only by carrying out a gradient revolution can the revolutionary leadership activate the peasant masses as the main force of the revolution and realize the basic alliance of the proletariat and the peasantry. From the ranks of the downtrodden peasantry can then be drawn the greatest number of armed contingents. As it now stands, the new people's army is composed mainly of peasant recruits. The growth of our people's army depends on the support of the peasant masses. Our experiences in more than five years shows that we have created a total of 20 guerrilla fronts in seven regions outside Manila Rizal. These fronts continue to thrive in the countryside even in the face of the unprecedentedly harsh fascist countermeasures. Then follows the discussion on how revolutionary civil war is conducted in advanced capitalist countries, uh, preceded by long periods of parliamentary struggle. Back to the Philippines. In the Philippines, it is as necessary as it is possible to wage a protracted people's war. It is only through a long period of time that we can develop our forces step by step by defeating the enemy forces piece by piece. We are in no position to put our small and weak forces into strategically decisive engagement with militarily superior enemy forces. In carrying out the protracted people's war, we applied the strategic line of encircling the cities from the countryside. We steadfastly developed guerrilla bases and zones at various strategic points of the country. In a subsequent stage, these areas shall be linked by regular mobile forces, which shall be in a position to defend larger and more stable revolutionary bases in the countryside. From such stable revolutionary bases, we shall be able ultimately to seize the cities and advance to a nationwide victory. While it is our principal task to wage a protracted people's war in the countryside, it is our secondary task to develop revolutionary underground and broad anti-imperialist and democratic mass movement in the cities. We should combine the revolutionary struggles in the cities and countryside, in the towns and barrios, in red areas, white areas, and pink areas. We should excel in combining legal, illegal, and semi-legal activities to a widespread and stable underground. The third section, fighting in a small mountainous archipelago. The Philippines is a small mountainous archipelago. It is made up of some 7,100 islands and islets with a total land area of 299,404 square kilometers or 115,600 square miles. The 11 largest islands compose 94% of the total land area and also contain 94% of the total population of the country. Every one of these and many other islands have a mountainous terrain with fertile soil. The importance of an island is not determined solely by its size. Population, forest area, and mountainous terrain are more important consideration for our people's war, especially at the initial stage. There are three outstanding characteristics of the Philippines in being an archipelago. First, our countryside is shredded into so many islands. Second, our two biggest islands, Luzon and Mindanao, are separated by such a cluster of islands as the Visayas. Third, our small country is separated by seas from other countries. From such characteristics arise a problem that are very peculiar to our people's war. On the one hand, it is true that our countryside is wide in relation to the cities. On the other hand, it is also true that we have to fight within, a narrow, within narrow fronts 
because the entire country is small and its countryside is shredded. The war between us and the enemy easily assumes the characteristics of being intensive, ruthless, and exceedingly fluid. Waging a people's war in an archipelag archipelagic country like ours is definitely an exceedingly difficult and complex problem for us. At this stage that we are still trying to develop guerrilla warfare on a nationwide scale, the central leadership has had to shift from one organizational arrangement to another so as to give ample attention to regional party and army organizations. There is only one manifestation of the problem. Armed propaganda teams and initial guerrilla units scattered in far-flung areas are susceptible to being crushed by the enemy. This is another manifestation of the problem. There is no doubt that fighting in an archipelago country like ours is initially a big disadvantage for us. Since the central leadership has to position itself in some remote area in Luzon, there's no alternative now or even for a long time to come but to adopt and carry out the policy of centralized leadership and decentralized operations. We must distribute and develop throughout the country cadres who are of sufficiently high quality to find their own bearing and maintain initiative not only within a period as short as one or two months, periods of regular reporting, but also within periods as long as two or more years in case the enemy chooses to concentrate on an island or a particular fighting front and blockade it. In the long run, the fact that our country is archipelagic will turn out to be a great advantage to us and a great disadvantage to the enemy. The enemy shall be forced to divide his attention and forces not only to the countryside, but also to so many islands. Our great advantage will show when we shall have succeeded in developing guerrilla warfare on a nationwide scale, and when at least we shall have been on the threshold of waging regular mobile warfare in Luzon or in both Luzon and Mindanao. We take advantage of a few major islands first and then other islands later. This is now well understood in the Visayas. In every island or in the specific part of an island that we choose to concentrate on, we must develop self-reliance, maintain our guerrilla units within a radius that is limited at a given time to avoid dissipation of our efforts, but wide enough for maneuver and advance wave upon wave, always expanding on the basis of consolidation. Among several guerrilla squads, it is necessary to have some center of gravity or rallying point, either for temporary retreat or for a concentrated operation against the enemy. At the same time, we, shall never lose, should, we should never lose sight of the necessity of fluidity, which often requires the shiftiness of such a center. Its regional party organization should see to it that at the present stage, it develops only one, two, or three armed fronts. The regional executive committee of the party should be based in the main front. <coughs> More guerrilla bases and zones should arise only upon the consolidation of the few that could be sufficiently handled at one time. At present, it is not necessary to have an armed force in every province within a region. More often, it is advisable for us to locate our armed force at an inter-provincial border area for maximum effect because in the first place, we do not have enough arm strength for every province. The principle of self-reliance need to be emphasized among all revolutionary forces on a nationwide scale. This is because our small country is cut off from by seas from neighboring countries, particularly those friendly to our revolutionary cause. The Vietnamese, Cambodian, and Laotian peoples are more fortunate than us in one sense because they share land borders with China, which serves as their powerful rear. Self-reliance can never be overemphasized among us. The mountainous character of the country countervails its archipelagic character from the very start. A mountainous terrain with some population, with thick vegetation, is an excellent condition for our people's war. If, on one hand, the archipelagic character of the country has a narrowing effect on our fighting fronts, its mountainous character has both a broadening and deepening effect. Mountains are usually the natural borders of provinces. Thus, we can maintain influence in several provinces even if we were to operate from only one mountainous border area. Also, the enemy cannot easily approach us because of the rough terrain and we have more opportunity than anywhere else to conduct political work among the people. Before he starts to climb a hill, we can receive 
the relayed reports from the masses in the towns and in the barrios. We can actually see his coming from vantage points and we can size up his operation in its possible times span by the sight of his troops, trucks and planes. We can therefore prepare for his coming. <coughs> the Sierra Madre shows up almost the entire region of Luzon on the eastern side of the Cagayan Valley to the Bicol region through central Luzon. It links as many as nine provinces. At central points, it links two or three provinces at the same time. The Cordillera and Ilocos Mountains cover the middle and western parts of northern Luzon. This link as many as 11 provinces. At certain points, they link as many as four provinces at the same time. Mindanao is an even more mountainous and more forested island than Luzon. At the center of Mindanao are the mountainous provinces of Bukidnon and Cotabato. These are well populated as the mountain provinces of northern Luzon. These are linked up with almost all of the Mindanao provinces. Outside of Luzon and Mindanao, the mountainous of Panay links four provinces and those of Samar, Leyte, and Mindoro link two provinces at the same time. A mountainous terrain where more people inhabit the foothills, clearings, plateaus, and riversides or creek sides is more favorable for the people's army. The usual inhabitants of these mountainous areas are national minorities and poor settlers. These are very receptive to revolutionary propaganda. Their common enemy is the reactionary government which treats their land as public lands and either directly grabs these from them or allows big landlords, big bureaucrats or big capitalists to grab these from them. The fact that we have given the highest priority to creating guerrilla bases and zones in mountainous areas has helped us in a big way to preserve our guerrilla forces in the face of so many small and big campaigns of encirclement and suppression launched against us. Without the use of Sierra Madre, our small forces in Cagayan Valley with only three companies as main force could not have preserved themselves against 7,000 enemy troops. Without the use of the mountainous areas of Sorsogon, our small initial forces there could not have expanded to their peak of one platoon-sized main force and eight squads and could have been more easily reduced upon the coming of 1,000 enemy troops. Our point is to use the combination of less populated mountainous terrain and the better populated plains, relying mainly on the former for military purposes at this early stage of our people's war. From the mountainous and hilly areas, we can expand towards the more populated plains. Even when we shall have gone into far in building bases on the plains, our mountainous and hilly bases will retain their strategic importance as guarantors of the victory, victorious advance of people's war. The central revolutionary base can best stand on the well-inhabited mountainous terrain that is of the greatest breadth in Luzon. Everywhere bases on the plains, sea coasts, lakes, and rivers will find the indispensable support of bases in the mountainous and hilly areas. Amidst the 20 guerrilla bases and zones already in existence and on the basis of the experience gained in, cheat, in creating them, the central leadership can proceed to establish the central revolutionary base somewhere in the well-inhabited mountainous areas of northern Luzon. The guerrilla bases and zones of northwest Luzon, northeast Luzon, and central Luzon can stand as the future terminals of rev mobile forces that are to arise at the Central Revolutionary Base. After doing well in building two or three guerrilla bases in every region outside Manila Rizal, we can go on to create more guerrilla bases and zones of every type. Every regional organization of the party, the People's Army, is to establish its own central base and raise in the long run regular mobile forces. On the eve of the nationwide seizure of power Manila Rizal, shall be caught in a pincer between regular mobile forces from the north and from the two regions of southern Luzon. Because the country is archipelagic, it is a matter of necessity for us to develop guerrilla bases and zones along the sea coast. Communications is one clear immediate reason. We should be able to develop as many routes as possible between Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao by conducting political work among the fishermen and seamen. This would constitute a good support for our guerrilla warfare on land. The fourth section, from small and weak to big and strong. We must recognize the balance of forces between us and the enemy. This is the first requirement in waging either an entire war or a campaign or a single battle. As matters now stand, we are small and weak while the enemy is big and strong. There is no doubt 
that is extremely superior to us militarily in such specific terms as number of troops, formations, equipment, technique, training, foreign assistance, and supplies in general. It will take a protracted period of time for us to change this balance of forces in our favor. Thus, protractedness is a basic characteristic of our people's war. The strength of our full-fledged guerrilla forces is a far cry from the regular military strength of the enemy. The typical center of gravity for our guerrilla forces is of mere platoon size. Around it gravitate armed propaganda squads and full-fledged guerrilla squads. So far it is in northern Luzon, where we have reached the company level of formation with some sufficient strength and performed company size operations. Now even here, the level of armed activity is reduced to that of platoons and squads. However, the reduction of strength here as a result of relentless enemy campaigns is more than compensated by the growth of the New People's Army on a nationwide scale. Of course, if we were to include part-time guerrilla and militia units, we would be able to cite a higher figure for our military strength. But then, these as a body of armed men are small and weak in comparison to the enemy's own irregulars, the civilian home defense forces, which are far better armed. We cannot properly evaluate our accomplishments in the military field without giving due consideration to certain objective conditions. The subjective forces of the revolution, especially the party and the people's army, started from scratch. The party has rebuilt from a scratch on December 26, 1968. How, moreover, it had to face attacks not only of the bare-faced enemy, but also the vicious labor revisionist remnants of the old merger party. The new people's armies was also built from a scratch on March 29, 1969. Moreover, it had to face not only the reactionary armed forces, but also the labor revisionist and the Tarok Sumulongang. At the moment, the only way to amplify our armed strength and fighting effectiveness is to give full play to the popular support that we enjoy. The bolos, spears, crossbows, traps, and other indigenous weapons which are the which the masses can easily avail themselves of, have to be combined with homemade explosives and the few rifles in our hands. By seriously implementing the policy of luring the enemy and advancing in waves on a favorable terrain, both strategically and tactically, we can most effectively put to use the combination of rifles and indigenous weapons, and we can certain, at certain times use only the latter if these are the only ones available. Depending on the circumstances, we have to dispose our limited forces in accordance with definite tasks, in a correct direction and within a definite radius. Our action takes the form of either concentration, shifting, or dispersion. We concentrate to attack the enemy mainly in the form of ambushes and raids on small enemy units that we can wipe out. We disperse to conduct propaganda and organizational work or to disappear before the enemy. We shift to circle or retreat to gain time and seek favorable circumstances for attack. Our guerrilla warfare is characterized by flexibility or timely shifting from one mode of action to another and by fluidity or frequent shifting of ground. We must grasp and give full play to this characteristic to maintain the initiative against the enemy. Our experience has shown that our superiority over the enemy lies in our fighting a just war a war for the people's democratic interest. We could not have lasted for so long with so small and weak an armed force were it not for the correct ideological and political line that the CPP has carried since its re-establishment. The NPA fights for the people's democratic interest with self-abnegating and highly conscious iron discipline and with wise and well-informed courage. Our red commanders and fighters fight without fear of sacrifice and death because they are fighting in the broad interest of the people and not in the narrow interest of the imperialists or any individual or clique among the reactionaries. At the level of strategy, our red commanders and fighters hate and are contemptuous of the enemy, but at the tactical level, they take serious and meticulous consideration of him so as to defeat every plot and maneuver that he is capable of. The fifth section, a fascist puppet dictatorship amidst crisis. The setting up of the fascist dictatorial regime of the U.S. Marcos clique is the clearest manifestation that the ruling political system is wracked by a crisis that it can no longer deal with in the old way. The fascist puppet dictatorship is a counter-revolutionary measure of weakness and desperation rather than of strength. 
A whole series of terrorist acts capped by the Second Plaza Miranda Massacre was unleashed by the Marcos ruling clique to pave the way for it. These events and subsequent imposition of a fascist martial rule and of a conspicuously automatic rule have incurred the profoundest hatred of the people and have intensified their desire for revolutionary change and for national freedom and democracy. The mastermind behind the fascist dictatorship is U.S. imperialism. The fascist dictatorship has been set up to make sure that under a new constitution, the privileges and interests of U.S. imperialism under the 1935 constitution, the Parity Amendment, and the Laurel-Langley Agreement are not only preserved but even enlarged in the face of growing anti-imperialist struggle of the broad masses of the people, and furthermore, to harden the Philippines as a base of U.S. imperialism in the western rim of the Pacific and in Asia, and in the face of the failed U.S. war of aggression in Indochina. All the fascist acts of the U.S. Marcos clique, carried out with brute and armed force, are calculated to stabilize the rule of issue imperialism and the local reactionary classes over the broad masses of the people. There are no significant armed forces opposing the fascist dictatorial regime except the New People's Army and the Bangsa Moro Army. In Luzon, Visayas, and the greater part of Mindanao, there is no significant armed resistance except that waged by the New People's Army. We might say that in these areas we are faced with a unified fascist reaction. There is no open war among the reactionaries here because there is no open war among the reactionaries where it is. The New People's Army is faced with a unified fascist reaction. This means to say that the enemy can launch stronger offensives against us than otherwise in any particular area which he chooses to concentrate on. This is certainly a disadvantage for us. In this regard, we have no alternative but to study and apply the correct strategy and tactics of dealing with enemy campaigns. However, experience has shown that no matter how far the armed resistance in southwestern Mindanao is, it has induced the enemy to drastically reduce his forces in Cagayan Valley since March 1973. While it is true that we are faced with a unified fascist reaction in Luzon, Visayas, and the greater part of Mindanao, there is but this is but the surface of a situation in which the broad masses of the people are seething with hatred for the enemy and are enthusiastically supporting the early beginning of our people's war. Beneath the apparent strength of the enemy is the deep-going crisis about an irremediable rottenness. If not for the broad support that they enjoy, that our small armed units would not be able to last long against the powerful assaults of the enemy. Sixth section under one imperialist power. The single most valid explanation why there is yet no open war among the reactionaries despite all the bitterness of the internal contradictions among them, a contradiction so far marked by the unilateral act of terrorism and violence by the Marcos fascist gang, is that the entire country is under the domination of one imperialist power. The country is therefore so much different from the China that was divided among several wrangling warlords supported by several contradictory imperialist powers. U.S. imperialism is the single most important determinant force in the reactionary politics in the country. The fascist dictator Marcos is aware that the length of his political life, including his personal safety, depends on U.S. imperialism. Thus, he does everything to satisfy his imperialist master. U.S. investments in Asia are most concentrated in the Philippines and continue to expand in the Philippines. According to conservative 1972 estimates, which do not fully take into account the current market value of all U.S. assets in the country, U.S. direct investments alone amount to $3 billion, this comprising 80% of foreign investments in the country are strategically located and enjoy a high rate of profit. Under these circumstances, we are certain that U.S. imperialism is even more sensitive to the development of our people's war in the Philippines than it has ever been in the people's war in Vietnam or elsewhere in Asia. The stakes are bigger in the Philippines. So we can expect that U.S. imperialism, despite its own pious words about withdrawing from Asia, will commit its own aggressive troops against the Filipino people in the event that the local reactionary armed forces would no longer suffice. Since the resumption of our people's war, U.S. military and police advisors on counterinsurgency have been increasing and participating in training and military operations against the people. 
The sale and free grant of military material to the local reactionary armed forces have been stepped up. U.S. aircraft flown by U.S. pilots have been involved in reconnaissance and bombing operations against us. U.S. Green Beret reconnaissance teams have been deployed under the cover of civic action in various parts of the countryside. AID, Peace Corps, and other extensively U.S. civilian personnel have been used for intelligence purposes by the U.S. country team composed of U.S. ambassador of the U.S. Ambassador, the CIA Station Chief, JUSMAG Chief, AID Director, and the USIA Head. In the face of U.S. imperialism, we are in dire need of international support, the support of the, those abroad who are in sympathy with our just revolutionary cause is indispensable to our victory. Though we stand fairly for self-reliance, we do not mean to say that this stands for reducing foreign support and assistance to zero. As a matter of fact, as the revolutionary armed struggle progresses, the volume of foreign assistance may increase, though it may decrease in proportion to our total war effort. It has been demonstrated in the Vietnam War that as the level of armed struggle rose, the volume of international assistance grew. This is because U.S. imperialism heavily supported its puppets and unleashed the largest, longest war of aggression after World War II. The seventh section, this is the last, decline of U.S. imperialism and advance of the world revolution. The Philippine Revolution, particularly our People's War, is greatly advantaged today by the decline of U.S. imperialism in Asia and throughout the world and corollarily by the advance of the world revolution. The main trend of revolution keeps on advising because of the ever worsening crisis of U.S. imperialism and the entire capitalist system. The world capitalist system continued to undergo a general crisis even as the first inter-imperialist war had just ended. Subsequently, fascist regimes emerged in a number of Western European countries and in Japan. The struggle for the redivision of the world among the imperialist powers further intensified. Inevitably, World War II broke out, as it did in connection with the first inter-imperialist war. The United States made profits and loans and war production before and throughout the war and provided supplies to both warring sides until it was ready to join the war on the winning side and pick up the spoils. The United States emerged from the war as number one imperialist power. The gains made by the revolutionary forces in the course of the war, when the U.S. forces temporarily retreated from the country, were squandered and lost. Recovering the Philippines, U.S. imperialism proceeded to expand in Asia and oppose every anti-imperialist struggle in the region. Soon after China's liberation, U.S. imperialism launched a war of aggression against the Democratic People's Republic of Korea and failed to accomplish its objective of conquering the whole of Korea. Then it formed the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization and violated the Jidima agreements on Indochina. Failing to learn its lesson from the Korean War, it once more launched a war of aggression in Vietnam and tried to defeat the people of South Vietnam, ruin the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, and subjugate the whole Indochina. At the height of the Vietnam War, 700,000 U.S. aggressor troops and 1.5 billion puppet troops were used against the People's Armed Forces. About $150 billion was spent by the U.S. imperialists to carry out their war, but they were forced to withdraw in defeat. The Vietnam War accelerated decline of U.S. imperialism not only in Asia but also throughout the world. This portion that follows deals mainly with the contention between the, U the two superpowers, U.S. and Soviet Union, which no longer exist today. Now the main imperialist contradiction is between a rising China and a declining United States. And the current concern is whether these contending powers would avoid a Thucydides trap. And for the revolutionary forces in the Philippines and the world over, the issue is how to take advantage of this contradiction in advancing the revolutionary cause. The Philippine Revolution, particularly the People's War that we are presently waging, finds abundant support not only among the broad masses of the people in the Philippines. It also finds abundant support in the peoples and proletariat of the socialist countries, colonies and semi-colonies, and capitalist countries. Support comes in general form of fighting in common against one or two superpowers, and in cases to increase in the future, also in the form of direct and concrete assistance to the Philippine Revolution. That's the end of the specific. So long as 
the oppression and exploitation of the Filipino people by U.S. imperialism and local exploiting classes persist. The Communist Party of the Philippines has fertile ground for leading and waging the People's Democratic Revolution. As the oppression and exploitation escalates under the U.S. Marcos regime, the CPP and the Filipino proletariat and people can win ever greater victories in the revolutionary struggle and realize a new Philippines that is truly independent, democratic, prosperous, socially just, and progressive in an all-around way. <laughs>